Welcome to Knitting Expat episode 58. Uh, today, well actually tomorrow, will be the 20th of April, Wednesday 20th, today's Tuesday, 19th. Um, as you can see, I'm not in my home. I am out and about. I am, uh, there's a little beachy area near where I live. This is different than where I uh, Instagrammed about earlier this week. Cars going by. Um, yeah, you see behind me is the view of uh, Manama, which is the capital city of Bahrain. Although, to be honest, the, the country is so tiny, it's all just one big city, really. But that's basically what downtown is. Um, and the main shopping areas and malls and stuff are all back there behind me. Um, so yeah, this where I am now, I'll sort of pan around so you can see, is a bit of a outcrop, it's a man-made outcrop. Um, sort of sand goes all the way back around there. And you can see behind me is loads of cars and stuff. It's, it's about 5.30 p.m. at the moment, so it's almost sunset. You can see the sunset behind me that way which is why I am filming this way around sorry if this is making anyone feel ill um, just I realize I haven't actually said my name yet I'm Mina hi <laughs> um, I am in Bahrain if you hadn't gathered that already and yeah I thought I'd try something new for the intro this week you can find me on Instagram as Mina Philip on Ravelry as Mina86 and there's a car about to go by with a couple of donkeys in the back so I thought maybe you'd like to see that <laughs> there they go um, yeah anyway so, I think, I think I covered all the main things. We have a podcast group, the Ning Expat Podcast on Ravelry, and yeah, I am starting to get very self-conscious by all the people staring at me, and I will see you back at home. Now we're back in my craft room, back in, uh, in my home. Um, <laughs> so that was something a little bit different for me. That was from yesterday, actually. Today is Wednesday, 20th of April, and uh, yeah, so I thought I would try something out a little bit different this week. Um, like I said in the, in the first little clip, that's a small little stretch of beach near where we live. Although well, calling it a beach is a bit of a stretch, it's like a, I don't even know what to call it, it's a kind of outcrop, like a sandbar almost, but it's man-made. Anyway, um, <laughs> a couple of things I forgot to mention um, was that it's on the northern side of Bahrain, that little outcrop area, so it's on the northern coast side, um, and we had the views out towards the capital city. I had meant to ask Perry to leave his iPad for me so I could show you on a screen, um, on a map, where it was, but I'll try and remember to do that next week. Um, and, and yeah, and at the moment, this time of year, the weather is so lovely in the evenings. Um, it was still quite warm, but it wasn't as hot as when the sun is up during the day, so when I was out there it was about 5.30 and sunset at about 6. At the moment, this time of the year, um, we don't have we don't do daylight savings in Bahrain or the Middle East in general doesn't do daylight savings. So the time of sunrise and sunset doesn't take, doesn't change that drastically throughout the year. Um, but I was surprised by how busy it was. Now, um, if everything goes well in editing, the very first clip you'll see as the title credits come up at the beginning um, with the episode name and everything, um, that was filmed a couple of days ago. I just popped down to that beach I was driving past that area and I sort of saw the turning. I was like, oh, I'll go and check it out, see what it's like today. Because the very first time I went to that beach, it was really, really wet. It was rainy, it was cold, it was horrible. It was not a nice day. Um, and then, so I thought I'd go back and just see what it's like. It was really quiet, there was no one else there. It was really lovely and it was about 4, 4.30. So I was thinking to myself, oh, I'll go back and I'll film like a bit of the podcast there one day. And anyway, I was out running errands yesterday afternoon and it was about 5, 5.15 I was like, oh, you know, whilst I'm out, um, I'll pop in, I'll pop into the beach and maybe I'll film like the intro or something there. It was so busy, it was so, so busy. I was so surprised by how many people were there. Um, and you'll have seen in the video, loads of cars like around there, parked up with like families out. And even from where I was standing across the sand on the other side, was um, were a couple of families with their dogs and their kids and stuff and I was just feeling very self-conscious that I was stood there holding my camera phone and talking to myself and uh, people tend to stare over here anyway so it was um, I was trying to ignore all of that but you'll notice I was incredibly distracted <laughs> throughout that video so uh, sorry if it was a bit weird but I did watch it back afterwards and I was like okay I actually managed to get everything in there I may have forgotten to say my name for the very first minute and in case you missed it, my name is Mina. I'm hoping this week to be able to start putting up little um, 
information bits at the bottom, at least just at the beginning for my name and where you can find me online and all that sort of stuff. I won't be doing it throughout the podcast because I don't have enough time to do that. And this week I've got a lot of stuff to talk to you guys about. So um, let's get going. I've got Hugo down here. I don't know if he wants to come up onto my lap or not, but we'll see. Um, as you can see, I've got a slightly different setup. Um, you may or may not know, I can't remember if I've told you guys this, but across this wall behind the camera, I have two desks, two of these IKEA desks set up um, side by side. So this is the desk that is right next to the window, uh, right next to the wall with the window. And then I normally film on the other desk, which is this side. Um, the reason why I've moved over is one, I think I might have some better lighting from this side. You might have a nicer view from behind me. Just ignore the messy pile there. Um, and as you can see, my sewing machine at the moment is on my ironing board because I've been using my sewing table to cut fabric. Um, and so I had a bit more space on this table to be able to shuffle over. Now I've also just realized that there's a gardener outside, um, right outside the window. <laughs> and whilst I've got a net curtain up, um, I'm not sure how much you can see and I can see movement and that's slightly distracting on that side. So hopefully it will be okay. Um, so yeah, hello to new and returning viewers. I don't remember if I said that in the first old intro section. If I didn't, I'm sorry. Welcome. Um, and I hope you enjoy what you'll see today. I'm trying out a few new things. And if you can hear the little jingling in the background, that's just Hugo at the cat tree. There's a little jingly toy on there. Um, anybody, you want to come up? Let me just see if I can grab him. Kill it. There he is. Neil Hugo, for those of you who haven't met him, for those of you who have, he'll make quite a few appearances on this show. That gives you a little bit of a clue. Um, yeah, let me just tilt the angle so you can see him a bit better, I just realised. Hmm. I don't know if you can see it there. There we go. Um, yeah, so I'll try and... Yeah? You happy? You've got something in your eye there. There we go. Okay, so let's get going with some admin -y stuff. First up, um, I want to let you know that I have filmed the German Short Row heel tutorial and um, the closing of the gap tutorial. I still need to edit those, so those will be edited soon. And I'll be getting in touch with um, a few people who've offered or who I've really spoken to about test knitting some of my sock patterns for me. It's more to test out the heel and to make sure that the instructions are clear. Um, I've knit all of the designs that are coming out in this first release twice myself. So I am pretty sure that, the, that those are fine. Um, so that's not really the concern. It's more just getting the um, heel. And then hopefully that those um, will be released in mid-May. The name I have come up for the collection is Beyond Vanilla Part 1, because there will be a big Beyond Vanilla Part 2. Um, with a, So this first collection will have four patterns, four sock patterns in it. And the second collection will have another four sock patterns in it, and that will come out maybe two or three months later. I'm kind of trying to uh, ease up on the pressure on myself with this whole designing thing. Um, so yeah, and the closing of the heel uh, hole video should be coming out pretty soon, like hopefully by the end of the week. Um, we also have a coupon code for the Primrose Yarn Company. Lovely Kelsey got in touch with me. We had a bit of an um, interesting conversation on Instagram, chatting about a few things, and uh, she offered a coupon code for you guys. So the code is Expat Knits. If I remember, I'll put it on the screen. Expat Knits, and that gives you 20% off at checkout until the 17th of May. So that gives you a month, um, or almost a month, to use that code. And I believe she said that she's going to be at a show next weekend. I think it is next weekend. So the shop might be closed for a couple of days. But I will link the shop in the show notes for you and the, the code and everything as well. Um, and yeah, I think I will move on. Oh, I was gifted a lovely pattern by um, Michael, who also has a podcast. I think it's called the Penguin Coffee Clutch podcast. I can't remember if I got the name right. I'll put it correctly in the show notes. Um, and he's, he offered his latest uh, le latest pattern, which is called the Quick Gift Drop Stitch Mitts. Um, I don't have it printed out to be able to show you, but I will show you next week. It'll be part of a prize um, for an upcoming knit-along, which I'll talk more about later. 
And I wanted to say finally, massive thank you to everyone who has bought one of my patterns, is knitting one of my patterns. I love seeing your pictures on Instagram and stuff, and it's been great to see it um, cropping up every now and again. And thank you for those of you who tag me in your pictures as well. It's really fun to see what you guys are knitting, um, or which of my patterns you're knitting. Um, and I've noticed a few people, a few podcasters have picked up on the, um, the Le Moyle show, Le Moyle show. And it's been great to see. I think there are four so at the moment that I'm aware of who are currently knitting that shawl. And it's great to see them picking up on brioche. And for some of them, it's their first time. There's um, Adrian of the Reluctant Sisters podca uh, podcast. Um, Laura, uh, who's uh, the dye behind Jinx Yarns. And uh, there's the Dyes Notebook podcast. And uh, Jenny, Lone Large Designs Jenny. She had a bit of a struggle to begin with, but she's doing so well. I'm so proud of her for doing it. And um, and also Kemper of Junk Yarn. So uh, so yeah, it's been great to see seeing their posts pop up on um, Instagram and seeing them talking about their shorts on their podcasts and how they're enjoying it and how uh, all the challenges and stuff. And it's been great. And uh, and yeah, so I'm really really excited by that. I'm so glad so many of you are enjoying that pattern and that the tutorials helped. Right. Okay. So the last couple of weeks. I haven't had that much to share with you with regards to podcasts that I've been watching, but this week I have been able, I've had a chance to catch up and actually caught up on all of my podcasts. I am now, I think my list currently stands at about 12 that I need to watch, and that's only because a whole bunch have got added to it this morning. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, so yeah, basically all that to say, I've had time to watch some new ones this week. So the first one I wanted to talk about is the Make Things Club with Sarah. She's based out of Edmonton in Canada, and um, yeah, I love her. I love her personality. She's very sweet, and love the things that she's knitting. I think she's relatively new to knitting, from what I gather. I've only watched one episode so far. Um, and she has a new one out that I haven't had a chance to look. I've only watched like a couple of her episodes, I think, and she's got a new one out that I haven't seen yet. But um, what was I going to say? I think she's a relatively new knitter. She's she's uh, planning on knitting her first sweater, and uh, yeah, and I love. I think it was in one of her videos, and I think her current video, the latest episode now, has this as well. She's got a pegboard behind her. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. I think the gardeners are freaking him out. He doesn't like it. Oh, and he's off. Yeah, he doesn't like that because um, they're right by the window. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it in the background. I really hope it's not distracting. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so she's got this pegboard behind her where she's got her yarn hanging from, and I think that was really cool. It was a really fun um, display idea, I thought, for the yarn. And see, so yeah, make sure you go and check her out. And then we've got Notorious, the Notorious podcast with Kelly and Carrie, and they're based out of Pennsylvania in the US, I think. I can't remember which town exactly. Um, and I think it was in the latest episode, Kerry, uh, Kelly, sorry, I'm trying to get the names right. Kelly was saying that... Um, Ravelries like Facebook for knitters and that's totally true. That's exactly how I explain it to someone who doesn't know what Ravelry, Ravelry is I say to my husband all the time. I'm like, it's just Facebook for knitters basically um, Yeah Sorry now he's peeking out the window to see what's going on Yeah he's So cute um, I wonder if I can show you really quickly Sorry if that got made anyone ill. Um, yeah, and then uh, Ke Carrie had a really cute t-shirt on as well. It was like a cat, so different cut out prints of cats on her t-shirt. And I thought that was really, really fun as well. I like that t-shirt. Um, but anyway, other than that, I like their knitting. And it's really fun to hear their stories. And again, I think they're relatively newish knitters. And they're a new podcast. They've only got three episodes out, three or four episodes out, I think. So yeah, make sure, and you probably heard about them from a couple of other podcasts as well so far already. So make sure you go and check them out. Um, the third one on the list is Risen Knits After Dark, and that's with Cassandra. And yeah, her podcast is really interesting. They're quite short. Um, she podcasts in the evenings after her her girls have gone to sleep. Uh, she's got two. She's got two children. And uh, and yeah, and it's it's really really interesting to hear listen to her. She's 
similar age to me. She's um, been knitting a similar length of time as me. I think she, I believe she's been knitting about two years as well. And, um, and she's also designing and coming up with patterns and stuff. So it's really interesting to watch a podcast of some from someone else who is in a similar sort of stage, I guess, knitting wise as me. Similar age, similar length of time knitting, both working on designs and stuff. So there's a lot there that I could relate with. And um, she's even knit a dress, like she's designed like a dress for herself that she was wearing in one of her episodes that I saw was a yellow one. I thought that was really cool, really fun. It's something I'd like to do at some point, but I think I, I always worry that I might get bored after a while knitting that much stock in it. But it's something I would like to try. And honestly, I think the real, the real reason I haven't done it is because frankly, I'd never wear a knitted dress here. But um, maybe if I did one out of cotton or linen, that'd be good, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, make sure you check her out as well. And the next one I wanted to talk about was the Knit Kid podcast. And this is a little boy, Gavin, he's 10 years old. He started a podcast, he's got two episodes out now and he is amazing. I cannot believe that he's doing what he's doing at the moment, it's insane. He's um, knitting socks, not only is he knitting socks, he's knitting socks two at a time. And um, he, was, he was using the pattern that I created for two at a time socks and the tutorial and stuff. And it was amazing to see his progress and how he's doing. He's um, he's knitting cables. And he's fearless. Like, if you're talking about a fearless knitter, that he basically is that. Like, he doesn't let anything stop him. He's very sweet. His podcasts are really short, 15, 20 minutes max. So he's only got two at the moment. And he's so adorable. You have to check him out. Give him all the encouragement because, um, yeah, he's doing great. Um, and the last podcast I wanted to mention this week is The Yarn Parlour, and that's with Alison, and she's based out of Israel. And she has a lovely podcast. I believe she's American, I'm judging by the accent, but I could be wrong. Sorry, Alison, if I got that wrong. Um, she has a lovely podcast. She talks about, she actually talked about the fear of knitting, which was a topic I brought up a couple of weeks ago. Um, she talks about that in her episode 12, which I found quite interesting to hear um, her perspective on it. And she knits, uh, or she has knit quite a few things with a knitting machine. I believe she did something to do with knitting or fiber arts at university, maybe, because she talks about when she was doing classes and stuff. So I'm not entirely sure on that um, because I haven't watched some of her older episodes to see if she's talked about that or not. But she has a couple of knitting machines and she shows in episode 13 some of the garments that she's made using the knitting machine. I love that that was quite interesting because I've never. I've never used a knitting machine, I've never seen a knitting machine in real life, I've only seen them on video, so it was interesting to me to um, to hear about that. And uh, yeah, so make sure you check out her, her podcast as well, like I said, I'll have all of these podcasts linked in the show notes, and um, yeah, and you should be able to find them all there if you haven't been able to catch what I've said here. Um, right, let's move on to finished objects. I'm going to start with um, the two pairs of socks that I finished this week first and then we'll move on to the thing hanging around my neck that you all want to hear about. Um, <laughs> so we'll do the socks first. First pair that I finished this week are these ones which I knit out of Inspirational Yarns in her Budgie Brights colorway. And this is on her Inspire Speckles base which is 85% Superwash BFL, 15% Donegal Net. It's 400 meters and 100 grams. And this is there's a good color representation there. It's a tweed yarn. I'm not sure if you see the tweediness in there. And it took a lot of effort on my part not to pick out all the tweedy bits as I was knitting. Because it keeps but it knits up beautifully. I knit these on my carbons, and I have to say, I as much as I want to love my carbons, I don't love my carbons. They're not terrible needles, they're not. They hurt my hands more than my other needles do, which is weird. And my gauge is so loose on these socks. I mean, you can, these are really quite a bit looser than I normally get. I knit these on 2.25 millimeters and my gauge was ever so slightly less than eight stitches per inch. And usually I get eight and a half stitches per inch on 2.25s. So I was getting the gauge I get on 2.5 millimeter needles, which is very strange because that's not usual. And because of that, I added in some ribbing. So this is on the back of the leg, um, just above the ankle, or just around the ankle. 
So I added some two by two rib centered across the back here to just sort of cinch it in. You can see without it being on my leg, but that's cinched in. And then I went back to stocking it just before doing the heel for a few more rows. But um, this just means that it's not hanging or baggy around the ankle. And this is also one of the reasons why I only have a, a pattern on the front, because then it allows me to make any adjustments that I need for fit across the back. Um, if I need to increase stitches or decrease stitches or add ribbing and stuff, and it wouldn't, won't affect the pattern running down the front of the foot. So that's pair number one finished. Uh, the second pair of socks that I knit this week, or finished this week, was um, out of the Eternity Ranch Knit Yarn. And this is uh, on a 75 super wash merino, 25 nylon base, 463 yards and 100 grams in the Caramel Kisses colorway. And honestly, you'd think these were two different balls of yarn. They are so different, but, it's, but I quite like it. I love the difference. It's really funny though, because when you look at the ball caked up, you I can't tell. I, I even looking at it now, I wouldn't be able to tell you. I mean, I'd say I guess probably this one is the more saturated one, but I can't say for sure. And it's really hard to know looking at it in the cake which one was which. But one turned out super saturated, and one a lot less so. Let me get a good angle on this. There we go. But yeah. But having said that, I know this bothers some people, it doesn't bother me at all, clearly. But um, what I find that this actually worked out quite well for me in this instance is because I've got a design across the front, you will then be able to see what the design looks like on a more heavily saturated speckled yarn compared to a more lightly saturated speckled yarn. So it, it almost, it's almost like I've knit up an extra sample, which is great <laughs> and works out quite well. And these both have the German short row heel on them as did the other pair. Um, okay, so we will move on to my third finished object for the week, which is the one hanging around my neck. And yeah, Ooh, just move that out, Ooh, move my hair out of the way. And so this is the Budding Bluebells shawl, designed by me in collaboration with uh, Nicole of He Loco, and I've used her yarns for this, which will be the pattern sample. Um, Oh, there was something I forgot to mention about the socks. Um, when I knit socks, especially if it's pattern socks, because for me, I always only, like I said, do, do the pattern across the front, or if it's vanilla after I've knit the heel, I go back and I weave in the end at the top for the cuff. That way, when I get to the toe, once I've finished and kitchen the toe, all I've got to do is just weave in that end and then they're done and there's no more ends to weave in or to avoid or whatever, and it just makes it really quick. So, a little tip for you there. So, back to the shawl. Um, yeah, so, let me take it off and I'll show it to you. I think once I take it off, I won't put it back on because it's quite warm in here. But just to show it to you on, I've got one, um, one thing under, one end under, and one end over. And it just sort of sits quite nicely like this. Um, I did make a slight change, like I talked about last time. I'm at, I added a garter border compared to the first version. And this helps it lay flatter, I guess is the right way to put it. And this is what it looks like. You can see it better here. And yeah, and I love how it turned out. It's huge, it's massive, it's over two meters long. I think it's about 2.15, 2.2, it's like over 80 inches. And it's about 40-ish centimeters deep, or I could have made it could have blocked it harder but didn't want to block it too hard and you can see if he looks there I'll give you a little close-up of the stitches yeah and I love how it's turned out because the lace is just opened up nicely bottom there and I did I filmed the blocking process for this one um, so I will pop that in here for you guys to have a little look and I had the help of my trusty kitty friend to help me out with that one. <laughs> Hugo was my supervisor. Um, and you'll see, like I always say, he has zero interest in my knitting. He has zero interest in wool and yarn, and wet yarn especially. Couldn't care less. He was all about the blocking wires. All about the blocking wires. So I will pop that in here for you guys.
that little clip I put together for you guys if you like that sort of thing and you want me to do more of that sort of stuff please let me know I'm more than happy to try and do more stuff like that um, like I said Hugo was my trusty little helper and I hope you get some tips on blocking and one thing I wanted to talk about was I know a few people had mentioned either on podcasts or in other places I can't remember um, that they get a weird little bump at the top and as you can see mine doesn't have that my shawl doesn't do that weird bump thing it's a nice straight line it doesn't um doesn't come up in the middle like a lot of you see a lot on crescent shawls that this bit is when the top comes up and people are asking how do they get rid of that when they block and as you see you'll see when i block mine i don't block the top edge straight i block it at a, at a you know at an angle at a curve and that curve means that when you then block out the bottom this is going to be really hard for me to show it to you, but you see in the video that when you, when I've got it on there and I'm blocking out the bottom, this it pulls it out, not just flat down. It pulls it out, out, down and around a little bit. So it's um, I don't know why, but that I mean there is a reason why that works. It's just very hard for me to explain it. Um, when you try to block it straight flat, because it's not a flat piece of knitting, that's the problem. It is curved, so you need to block it curved to counter the bulge i hope that makes sense but you see how i blocked it in that video and um it just means after the fact i don't get that bump at the top it's nice and flat and it doesn't bulge i uh, see on the other side that there's no bulge in that top edge um and that's just what works for me um i find i also don't do a garter tab cast on at the top of my crescent jewels i find that you know once it's blocked, it's virtually unnoticeable at the top. You have to really be looking at it. And you're wearing it around your neck, no one's going to see the cast on anyway. Um, 
again, just my preference. Um, and it does help avoid the bulge. Um, and yeah, I did add a doll size version of the shawl in the pattern. At the very bottom, I kind of tell you how many repeats to do of which sections to get the same size as the little swatch that I showed you a couple weeks ago. After when I showed that, I had a few people get in touch with me um, to ask if they, if they could buy that from me for their for a doll. And I was like, don't, don't, I'll, you know what, I'll put the instructions in the pattern. You can just knit that um, with some scrap yarn. It took less than 20 grams to knit that swatch. So um, you could definitely knit up a, sample, knit up a, a doll size one yourself. Uh, with the instructions in the pattern <laughs> there's no need to like buy one from me um so i was quite surprised and it wasn't just one person there was more that there was like two or three people who asked about it so um so that will be um in the pattern as well <laughs> for those of you who are interested in it um like i said with all of my patterns that are adjustable this one is really adjustable the across the pond is really adjustable my le Molleux shawl is really adjustable that's that one up there sorry that one up there um, what else? I can't remember now, but sorry. All of my adjustable patterns are just that, they're adjustable, so you can make it as big or small as you like. Um, the shawl is currently being tested by some test, by my test knitters. I believe three, three of them, or four of them have finished now, and there's three more still working on theirs, and the, the, the deadline for them is next week, next Friday, so they still got some time and um, yeah once it's all done and ready I will be releasing it and it will be released on the 30th of April um, let me just see where we go so, yes yeah, so the pattern will be released on the 30th of April and the kickoff for the knit along being co-hosted by myself and Nicole of Hiloko will be the 1st of May the knit along will run for two months so that'll be until the end of June and yeah, make sure you take part in both groups. Both of us will be hosting in our groups. I know Nicole just released her latest podcast went up, well, I guess overnight or this morning. I just saw it before I started recording. So I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, but I believe our rules are going to be very similar. Um, she's getting some kits ready for the shop to be, for her shop ready to be released. There'll be kits in the same colorways as this shawl. Um, and I believe she's putting together a couple of other color options as well for kits and the kits will come with the two skeins of yarn you need to knit the shawl and um a coupon code to download the pattern from uh the Ravel my Ravelry shop once it goes up um once it's published on the 30th of April and so like I said the kickoff is going to be for the cow is going to be the first of May so it gives you a day to uh I don't know get ready <laughs> after the pattern's released um what I might do and I haven't fully decided this yet what I might do is put up the pattern page um, a few days before so it'll have all the information on there about how much you need and everything and in the pattern as well I very clearly explain exactly how much yarn how many meters how many yards I use for each section to knit the size that I'm showing you here and the pattern is like I said it's very adjustable and uh, completely adaptable to however much yarn you have you don't have to have a full 200 gram skein of yarn, two, two 100 gram skeins of yarn to knit this shawl. If you have slightly less yardage or slightly more yardage, you could totally knit this small or larger to fit what you have. And just to let you guys know, this used about, let me just check my notes here. Um, yeah, so this version used 168 grams of yarn. So, and I left the scraps over there for some reason, but I had two little nuggets of yarn left, which was fine. I mean, I could have gone I could have made it larger, but I think this is sizable enough. Um, and I wanted some leftovers to use in my blanket and to swap with people. So yeah, my budding bluebells. And I'm really happy with how this one turned out. Uh, doo -doo -doo. What else was there? Oh, and I will um, announce prizes for the knit along next week. The prizes are gonna be up for grabs and uh, hashtags to use if you are using Instagram is going to be um budding bluebells cal budding bluebells kal on instagram so please follow along on there so we can i mean please play along on there as well and use the hashtag so we can follow along and see what you're up to um yeah i think that pretty much covers the finished objects <laughs> we'll move on to works in progress i haven't added anything to my blanket this week so i'm not even going to show you that 
Um, I only have one project on the needles that was on the needles last week, so we'll start with that one. First one up is in my little bobbins project bag. Lovely Danny. What I've started to do in my show notes is I am um, not linking, but on each line where I've got, okay, so this is this project, and I talk about the yarn, um, which yarn dyer I've used, or which yarn brand I've used. I'm also at the end putting which bag maker the project bag I've used is, so for those of you who are interested can see where the bags are from as well. As if the person has a shop. If they don't have a shop, I won't, I won't put their information because it's not really relevant. Um, so the first project is a pair of socks that I showed you last week, which I only had a little bit, a cuff and a little bit there. I've done the heels because these are the ones I used for the tutorial. And I only filmed that yesterday, so I haven't got very far after that. I, mean, I think I've done one repeat after the heel of the pattern. And yeah, I'm loving this yarn. This yarn is the By Knits yarn, dyed by my lovely friend Josie in the Wait For Me colorway. It's on her Luna base, which is 100% superwash merino, 400 yards. And yeah, I'm knitting these on my high highers, which flat out have to be my favorite sock needles. After all the socks that I've been knitting at the moment, I'm loving the high highers. The zings are a close second. I do actually really like the zings. I was surprised by how much I liked them. I was not expecting to enjoy anything with them as much as I did. I was also surprised by how much I didn't like the carbons. I was expecting to like them more than I did. So it's a bit of a shame really, I really like those, but I really wanted to like them as well, especially because they're quite expensive needles. So I don't know, I might give them one more go. Um, I've tried them out twice so far now and I've not really enjoyed working with them, but we will see. I will, like I said, I'll give them one more shot before I call it quits on the carbons. And the second work in progress I will show you is another pair of socks. And this is my expat yarn cow socks. This project bag was made for me as part of a swap by a lovely friend. So I don't have a shop, so I don't think it's necessary. Um, and these socks are the are from the yarn that the lovely Melissa sent me from Spicy Homemaker. This is Nomadic Yarns in her Brit Sock base, 400 yards, 80% superwash BFL and 20% nylon in the Get Lucky colorway. Helpful there. See that? And again, knitting these on high highers, a little gobstopper, and don't kill me. I know it's slightly sacrilegious to do this to a lovely hand wound ball, but I can't. I can't bring myself to knit one at a time, and I hate winding balls by hand, so I had to wind off half of it into a cake. I hope you're not mad at me <laughs> for doing that. Um, and then I picked out this purple, some Cascade Heritage sock yarn use as a contrasting heel and top heel on the, on the socks because I think purple goes really well with green and um, in this sort of chartreuse green yellow colour in the fall as well looks quite good with purple and it's a nice deep purple colour so I think that'll work out quite nicely and I cast these on yesterday I think Ooh. and I've got the cuff uh, 30 rows into 31 rows into the leg so I want to make these nice and long as long as I can be bothered to make them. Um, these don't have, these aren't really high priority. These are just whatever I don't want to pay attention to what I'm knitting, kind of knitting. Um, I'm not sure if Perry and I are going to go to the cinema this week, this weekend. If we do, then I might try and get past the heel so then I just have the foot to knit at the cinema um, or not knit on them at all so I can knit the leg at the cinema. I haven't fully figured it out. We had been thinking about going to see The Jungle Book, which came out this last weekend, but um, it only just came out this last weekend and neither of us are really big fans of crowds at the cinema, so we thought we'd skip that. Um, that's the second work in progress. Third work in progress is almost a finished object, <laughs> and this is in my uh, Maple Moose Fibres, not Fibres, yeah, is it Maple Moose Fibres or Maple Moose? Uh, Maple Moose Fibres, I've got it in my notes. Project bag, the lovely Tag by Michelle and the little Norris. Love it. Um, and the, what I'm knitting in here is the Hilltop Shawl by Helen Stewart of Curious Handmade. So this was a pattern that Helen released or designed for the Curious Handmade Country House Retreat that she hosted. And she designed this using the Cumbria yarn by um, the Fiber Company. And 
everyone who attended got two skeins of the Cumbria yarn to knit the shawl. And this is what it looks like. Excuse my handwriting, that's just me making my notes on there. Um, that's what it looks like. It's really beautiful, um, really sort of simple and elegant, but um, just a real comfort knit. And once I finished the Budding Bluebells shawl, and I was finishing up the other pairs of shawl, I was like, I just want to knit something that I don't have to think about. Because, <laughs> like, I, like I said last week, I've been knitting a lot of designs. And I just wanted something to think that I could knit without having to think about the design aspect of it. I wanted something that was not necessarily mindless, but that was, you know, that I just wanted to follow someone else's instructions, <laughs> I think, was really the gist of it. So this is the tag for the Cumbria yarn. Um, the yarn was so new at the time that um, the, the yarn didn't come with ball bands, so we just got one of these with the name of the yarn on it. Now the problem was, my yarn I, my yarn went through several swaps, so I never actually got the yarn that I first picked out. It didn't end up with the yarn I first picked out. I first picked out um, what was a really sort of dusky, purpley, morphe colour. A little bit different than what I normally go for. And the reason why I picked it was because um, I was like, okay, let's just push myself out of my comfort zone and go for something a little bit more muted than I normally go for. And then um, Helen saw the one that I picked out. She really wanted that colour. She had a really bright really lovely bright purple which was the other one I was looking at getting. It was sort of like a purple fuchsia type of magenta colour. It was really lovely and um, and so she had that one, she wanted the one that I had, I was like look it's fine we'll swap because that was the other one I was going to go for. I was trying to push myself out of my comfort zone but since you love this one so much you can have it and I'll, I'll take the other one, it's not a problem. And so we swapped and the one that, so that's the one I ended up with and that was called Purple More Grass in case you want to know what that looks like, you want to go look it up. Um, and then the lovely Pauline, who was one of the people at the event, at the retreat, she offered to hand wind my skeins for me into these beautiful um, centre pool balls. You, uh, you've probably seen Danny of Little Bobbins um, when she does it around her thumb. Similar thing, or basically the same thing. So she offered to hand wind my skeins for me. So when I gave her my skeins, she was like, oh, these are really beautiful. Like I, She was like, she wanted those. Like She would have picked those if she had the choice. And she had just traded one of her skeins for a different colour, so she had two different colours. I was like, okay, fine, I'll trade you if you want. If you want the purple, like that purple, you can have it and I'll take the ones that you've got because I really like those colours as well. So we traded. <laughs> so I went through several stages with my aunt and I ended up with two different colours. I ended up with these two. So you can see there's like flat pancakes at this point because I've been knitting from them. But... Um, and I wrote down the colours because they're not on this. So the green is uh, Grizzadale Forest and the blue is Derwent Water. I think they're named after places in Cumbria as well. Um, it's a really lovely, it's a heavy fingering weight. It's only 300 metres per 100 grams. And the content is 90% uh, wool, 10% mohair. Um, so you definitely see the mohair bits sticking out every now and again. It's a, oh sorry, here we go. It's a lustrous blend of brown, mash and wool, merino and mohair. So there's a some merino and mash in there as well. That make up that 90%. Um, it's really lovely. It's a hand wash only, so it's non super wash. It's, it's not rough, but it's not the softest, if that makes sense. It's kind of one of those in between, like you know, it's, it's a nice rustic yarn without it being scratchy. And so you guys want to see the shawl now after I've talked so much about the yarn. Um, this is where where I am at, at the moment. You, you can see here what I mean about the bump at the top. You can see there that it's sort of the bulge, kind of. You can see the top there. It doesn't lay flat, flat at properly, but that will fix itself with blocking. So I'm trying not to lose any stitches. And where I'm at is I have done all of the eyelets. Uh, if you remember from the picture, there are... There's four, row, four sections of that lace. So I've done those four sections. One, two, three, four. And I only have the last bit at the bottom to go. You see, mine doesn't look like Helen's, like I said, because I had two different colours. So I decided to do my thing and add stripes because that's what I do. Um, so I started with one solid section. Then I did the lace section in the green. Then I striped the green and blue. Did another solid lace section in green. The solid section in blue. Lace in green stripe section, lace and green, and then I'm doing the last section in blue. Now the thing is, I have a lot of yarn left over. Um, I'm gonna see where I'm at at the end of this blue section. 
So I'm going to do the, there's a pico bind off and I was going to do that in the green. But I might extend the shawl a little bit, make it a little bit longer because I have a lot left over and I think it might have to do with my gauge. I didn't check, the gauge that Helen includes in the pattern is um, for after blocking. But um, this doesn't seem to be that deep at the moment, but that could just, you know, could stretch out quite a bit with blocking, I think. And it is garter. Um, I think it'll be wide enough, that's not an issue. And I've really woven, started weaving in my ends um, along the edge here. I haven't trimmed any of the ends, but I do weave them in as I go, because then I don't have to worry about it so much at the end. Um, yeah, so this is very close to being finished. Probably would have been finished if I hadn't started um, a couple of other projects, but I wanted to show it to you as a work in progress. And I've got some cute stitch markers on here, which I wanted to talk about how I use these. So I've got a little kitty cat one, which was gifted to me in a swap. I have my donut from Melissa, which I've attached to a removable stitch marker to use as a progress keeper, and also to show which size is the front and back. And then I have this little owl at this end. Now, what I use the owl and the cat, I just realized I've got the owl and the busy cat. <laughs> totally unintentional, did not realize that until just now. Um, and if you know that rhyme, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, what I use these for is to keep track of my stitch count. And so I showed you last week how I use stitch markers in lace to keep track of stitch count and you just count the number of repeats and you multiply that by the number of stitches in each repeat to get your stitch count and then you just count the end stitches. So I do a similar thing with these stitch markers except I don't have repeats, I have a big long section in between. So every now, so once the shawl got to a certain size and I was like, okay, there's a lot of stitches on this shawl now, I don't want to have to every few rows stop and count and make sure I've got the right number of stitches. So what I did was, I knit a few stitches at the beginning or whatever, and then popped in a stitch marker, then um, knit across till I was almost at the end, went back and counted the stitches from the stitch marker up to wherever I was that I wanted to put the next marker in, and made a note of how many stitches are between those two markers. Then you knit however many more rows you want to do, and then you go back and then you can move those markers further out to add more stitches in between them. So what I did was I popped in markers when there was 270 stitches between them and then I moved them further apart once there was 300 stitches between. So there's now 300 stitches between these two markers and I know because there are no increases or decreases in this middle section, they only happened at the beginning. So I would know that there's always going to be 300 stitches between these two. So if I knit a few rows and I want to check my stitch count, I just have to count this end and this end and just add to 300 and I know that's my stitch count because there's always going to be 300 between these two unless I move one in which case I then make another note of how many stitches I now have between the markers um, that way you don't have to keep counting over 300 stitches every time and it just makes keeping track of your stitch count a little bit quicker um, little tip for you there I hope that's useful <laughs> uh, yeah and that is that for progress uh, for my third work in progress oh and the needles these are on zings these are four millimeter zings um which i'm trying out i, I quite like them they're good they're, like i said they're blunt so they're good for just sort of plain garter stitch and the lace section wasn't too difficult with this it's um slightly different it's not typical it's not just a regular eyelet lace this is very it's a different stitch and this worked fine for that oh sorry um enjoying knitting with those. They make that really sort of nice um, clinking noise that metal needles do that I really enjoy. Some people don't like that, but I do. Um, that back in there. So that's, like I said, work in progress number three. And the last one I just cast on yesterday, but well, yesterday evening. Sorry, I was about to fall off. It's in one of my rainbow bags. And it's also in my London bag because this has that much yarn that it needs two bags uh, to hold it in. But this just has the extra yarn in it until I get to it. And what I am knitting is the France Stone pullover by Jared Flood. And yeah, so I showed you a couple weeks ago that I'd knit the swatch for this and now I've started knitting it. Did anyone else do this by the way when they were at school or at university? I used to always like fill in the holes in the writing and my handouts and stuff. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's what I'm knitting. I am knitting the 43 inch size, 43 and a half inch size, which is the second size up, so it's the medium size. 
um, and I am using mystery yarn because I genuinely don't know what it is. This is the yarn color. Let's have to tag in clear. Let's just in this bag. Let me just get it. It's this mystery yarn that I picked up um, at uh, I Knit Fandango last year, May, when I went. And it says bought at Colonnet, so I'm wondering if it might be Colonnet just a potentially. I don't know. It's um, not something I've been able to find online. It says double knitting as in DK weight, but this is definitely more of a worsted weight, judging by the yardage. Um, so yeah, I'm knitting the brownstone. I got gauge just about with the needles, recommended needle size, so it's fine. And it's this beautiful sort of plummy purple with brighter spots in it colour. Um, there are definitely some skates that are darker, some are lighter. I had some issues with winding these yarns. Some um, were seriously tangled, but for the most part it was okay. And this is where I'm at. I have the start of two sleeves. <laughs> I have two cuffs. And this yarn is so soft. It is really, really soft to work with and really lovely. Um, yeah, so I have a sleeve. <laughs> it fits fine. Pretty good. This yarn bleeds though. This yarn bleeds like crazy. I don't think I mentioned it when I showed you the swatch, but when I was washing the swatch and blocking it, um, it bled so badly. It was, I was holding the swatch under the running water and the water coming out from underneath my hand was pink. Like it was bleeding that badly. It didn't even have to soak to bleed. The water just had to run through it and it would come out bright pink on the other side. So yeah, but I kind of expected that with this being a mystery yarn and not really knowing anything about it, um, other than it didn't cost much at all. Um, so you can't really, it was so soft. I was like, okay, even if this does bleed, even if it's a bit of a pain to work with or whatever, it's soft and it'll be nice to wear as like a round the house sort of jumper if nothing else. So that's what I'm knitting. And that is actually the size I probably would have picked out to knit for Perry potentially. So I'm, I'm also using this as a opportunity to practice knitting something in his size, but for me. Um, that way I can get an idea on um, sizing for him, potentially for future knits if I ever find something that he wants me to knit for him. Right, I'm going to take a quick break and I'll be back with acquisitions. All right, back with acquisitions now. And uh, yeah, don't have actually have that much to show you this week, but both the things that, um, I wasn't actually expecting to have any acquisitions to show you this week, but I popped to the post office yesterday afternoon and there was something waiting for me. So, start with that. I got a lovely package from the lovely Linda. Linda is someone that I've known for a while now. I knew her back before I started podcasting. She uh, used to live in Kuwait. I believe she's lived in Saudi Arabia before as well. But she came over to Dubai a few times when I was still living there and she came to a couple of the knitting meetups that I went to. So I got to know Linda um, quite a bit before, before, like I said, before I moved and before I started the podcast. So that was really lovely. And uh, she took part in the expat yarn swap. And she was actually partnered with... Uh, Shannon from Inspirational Yarns, um, who also sent me a lovely package, and then uh, Linda also wanted to send me something, which was very sweet of her, she really didn't have to, but she wanted to send me um, some local to her yarn, and the yarn that she sent me is from Serendipidai, Serendipidai, um, Dye Works, Serendipidai Dye Works, uh, so I believe, believe they're based out of California, possibly San Francisco, I think, around that area, um, Woodside. I'm not sure where that is, but um, they're on Etsy as well. So I'll, if I remember, I'll put the link. But I'll definitely put the name in the notes on the on the episode thread. And this is the yarn that she sent me. It's so soft. It is like ridiculous. It is 70% alpaca, 20% silk, 10% cashmere. This is just insanely soft. It's. I want pillows made out of this yarn. It is so delicious. And it's this beautiful, neutral, tonal grey. And thank you so much for sending me grey, Linda, because I love grey. And also, I always need grey to go with the crazies that are in that shelf. So it's like, so lovely. So 
Thank you so much, Linda. That's perfect. It's 437 yards in 100 grams. And the colour is smoke, which is rather appropriate. Uh, yeah. Love that. Thank you. She sent me this really cute fish card with a lovely note inside. She also sent me some minis, which are always welcome in this house. Minis. One's coming undone. Let me just fix that. Uh, and then she also sent me this cute little fridge magnet of San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, which is really fun. It's a really interesting um, bridge magnet. I've not seen ones like this before. Um, she also did send me some sweets. She sent me a bag of sour jelly babies, which Perry did the work, and a few little squares of uh, Garibaldi's chocolate, which I promptly ate. So I don't have those to show you, but they were very well appreciated. So thank you, Linda. Um, I love this. This goes straight on the fridge after we finish. I don't have that many fridge magnets, so this will be really fun to have. And the second acquisition I have isn't really knitting related, but it is kind of knitting related. You'll remember a few weeks ago, if you've been watching that long, <laughs> that I was talking about needing to get um, an external um, speaker, like a Bluetooth speaker for my laptop, because when I'm sewing, I can't hear anything playing on my laptop. The volume's not loud enough. Um, and a few of you suggest, gave me some really good suggestions for speakers and stuff to check out, and I was speaking to Perry about it, and he's really into that sort of stuff, like electronics and technology type of things. He he knows better than I do what would be, what, a, what would last well, what would be good, and all that sort of stuff. So we were supposed to go shopping one day, um, go check out a few electronics shops at the mall, and um, to buy something, to buy something for me. Anyway... Time went by, we were busy, things happened, we didn't get round to it. And then last weekend, I was saying to Perry, I was like, oh, we're going to the cinema, let's go to one of the mall cinemas so we could actually go and, you know, I, I could finally get a speaker. We've been talking about this for a while now and I haven't got one yet and let's go do that. And he's all umming and ahhing about it and being a bit vague and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, what? Anyway, I wasn't really going to push it that hard, but I thought, whatever. Um, and then he came out with it. He was like, I really ordered you one. <laughs> it should be coming soon I'm like oh okay he was trying to surprise me this poor boy has zero chances when it comes to surprising me I always end up sniffing it out unintentionally always happens um like this time for example he was trying to surprise me and I brought it up and he was like okay well if I if I um try and be disinterested and whatever you're just gonna get annoyed at me about it which is true, I probably would have, because it was his idea to do this. Anyway, what happened was, um, we cancelled our credit card lately. We had an American Express credit card that was coming up for renewal, and we just decided we didn't need it anymore. So we cancelled it, but we um, built up enough points on it that we could use the points for something. So Perry used the points to get me the speaker. So he didn't actually spend any money on it, which is even better, in my opinion. Uh, free things are better than um, things that you've had to pay for, especially this thing, because this thing is amazing. So what he got me was a Bose Soundlink Color, is what it's called. I got the white one. He said he didn't have a choice on the color. They just said what they wanted. Um, it's this tiny. It's literally palm-sized. It is... Although I have big hands, but this is basically the size of my hand. Um, this thing is amazing. We, I've only had it, it, he brought it home like two days ago, two evenings ago, so I've not even had it two full days yet. This is amazing. We brought, he brought it in and we, I, I took it out of the box and plugged it in and everything and hooked it up to my phone. I played Adele's Hello. I've never heard that song like that before. It was amazing. I was like, this is a completely different song. <laughs> it's crazy how much sound quality is improved when it's played on proper uh, through proper speakers rather than the phone or a laptop um even he was just like i wasn't expecting to be as impressed by this thing as i am and yeah it's really really good it's ridiculously expensive though if you're going to buy it i looked online it's 100 pounds or 130 dollars online on amazon and i i wouldn't pay that much for it but um, I do think Bose is generally slightly overpriced. But if you're ever able to get one on sale or if you have like similar sort of thing where you have points from a credit card or whatever that you can use to get one, um, I'd definitely say go for it because it's tiny. It's, it's weighty, but it's small. It's portable. It's Bluetooth. And it's, it's great. I love it. Um, super chuffed by that one. That was definitely a little win um, in our corner. But... Um, 
So yeah, like I said, Perry's always struggled with surprising me. I've always managed to sniff them out. I think he's only ever managed to surprise, genuinely surprise me once. That's when he proposed. That was the only time I didn't see it coming. I mean, I kind of knew that he would propose at some point soon because we'd been talking about it, but the actual proposal was a surprise because I wasn't expecting it when it happened. But um, that was funny. That's literally the only time he's ever genuinely been able to surprise me. I've always, I've always seen it coming otherwise, or unintentionally sniffed it out, as he puts it. Um, yeah, so that was quite funny. Um, and I think we we'll have a quick little break here for a kitty interlude. <laughs> long news and giveaways. Um, we have a sweater knit along going on in the group. That's a year long sweater count. I will be, I draw for prizes every quarter. So the next quarter prize will be drawn at the end of uh, June, end of June. We draw for the next sweater knit along winner. Um, then we also have the expat yarn cow which is going on and that is going on till the end of May. So um, basically you just have to use yarn from not from where you are basically um you can use uh what was it if you are doing a multi-skein project only one yarn has to be from has to be technically expat yarn but otherwise you're free to use local yarn as well if it's a multi-skein project or multi-yarn project um yeah just have fun with it really you don't have to have taken part in the swap to take part in the knit along um it's just a bit of fun just come and join in the rules are in the threads so you can go check it out there um, uh, for the 5,000 subscriber giveaway, we still have one person who hasn't gotten in touch. Uh, sorry, for the podiversary giveaway, not 5,000 subscribers, sorry. For the podiversary giveaway, we saw one person who didn't get in touch, and that was Kazzy B. Knits. That's Caroline from the UK, and she's won a pattern donated by um, Maureen of Victorian Studio Podcast. So, uh, Caroline, please get in touch with me. Let me know that you've seen this, and I will uh, put you in touch with Maureen to sort out your prize. And I quickly want to say massive apology. Last time I, last week, I made a bit of a boo-boo um, with the prize drawings. I made a bit of a mistake. I accidentally drew a winner for the uh, project bag and markers that Sue from Two Tangled Skeins um, donated, but she, she donated that prize for the expat yarn cow rather than the podiversary, and I accidentally drew for the podiversary. I got in touch with Sue as soon as I realised my mistake, which was after the podcast had gone up because my brain wasn't focusing or functioning, apparently. And I was like, I'm so sorry, Sue. I'm so sorry I made a mistake. I really hope you don't mind that I used it for that instead of that one. And um, I'm really sorry. <laughs> really, really sorry. And she came back and she was so gracious about it. She was like, it's not a problem at all. I'll, I'll also donate another one for the expat young cow. I wasn't expecting that at all. And I was just, I was so grateful. And I gifted her a couple of patterns of her choice for my Ravelry shop as an extra thank you for being so sweet about it. So there is still that prize for the expat yarn cow. And there was, so therefore, an extra prize for the podiversary. I still have to draw a winner for the Addicted to Sock Knitting e-scene, which I totally forgot to do before I started recording. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to... Um, I'm just going to do that after I've finished filming and I will contact the winner directly and uh, put them in contact with Deborah of the Addicted to Soft Knitting e-zine and sort out the prize directly that way because um, I forgot to do that before I started recording which anyway um, and then we have the Budding Bluebells knit along which is starting on the 1st of May which is a Sunday I believe and running for two months until the end of June um, take part the rules are quite simple you have to be a member of my group you have to knit the shawl 
And so enter a finished object in the finished object thread. You can chatter away in the chatter thread because I will also be drawing for some prizes from the chatter thread. Have fun and then enter as many other cows as you want. It's generally as simple as that. Um, but I will put up a thread for that um, this next week as well. And okay then, so I think we will move on to questions and answers. Uh, Kenji Nitter, who asked on, on Ravelry, she says, I had no clue that knitting was a workout. Do you or anyone have any thoughts or suggestions for a pre-knitting warm-up for your arms, hands, wrists? I've been experiencing lately sore muscles in my upper arms and shoulders. Any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. Um, uh, one second. I know that a couple of weeks ago, I think it is now, that Marsha of the Very Little uh, Twitch and Stitch podcast, she um, she did a little segment in one of her podcasts where she showed some stretches that she did. So, I mean, to be honest, I don't do anything special. I just make sure I stretch my arms out, stretch my just, just stretch my limbs out every now and again, get up, walk around, um, you know, just like pulling back on the... I don't have any specific exercises that I was shown by a doctor or anything for like specifically, but it's just generally just stretching slightly. Um, I will, let me just have a quick look. I can tell you which episode it is that Marsha talks about it in. Um, if I can find it, there we go. I believe it is in episode 28 of the Very Little Twitch and Stitch podcast. Uh, it's the first episode she does where she's on her own without Scylla because Scylla's got studies and stuff to do. So if you go and check out episode 28 of the Very Little Twitch and Stitch podcast, she has lots of uh, good recommendations for stretches to do for your wrists um, for knitting. And if I remember, I will make a note of that in the episode thread as well for you. Um, and then UK Knitter Sam says, had a question, she says, hi Mina, I'm not sure if this is the right thread but for this, but I was wondering how relaxed slash strict is the dress code for women generally in Bahrain as well as Dubai. I assumed you would have to be pretty covered up, but in your video of the marketplace in your last podcast, there seemed to be a big variation in what women were wearing. I hope this makes sense. Yep, totally makes sense. It is a question I get asked quite a lot, actually. Uh, especially when we first moved to Dubai, people were coming over, were, they weren't sure what they should be bringing clothes-wise. And frankly, Dubai anyway was a lot more relaxed. Um, I say not relaxed isn't the right word. Less conservative, dress dress code wise than um, Bahrain. Dubai has um, a very large um, their their income and their industry is mostly based around tourism. So they expect a lot of tourists. So they are much more open to um, relevant dress code, I guess, as that as it would go. They did there is dress codes like for the malls and stuff as well. You're supposed to wear you're supposed to have your knees covered and your shoulders covered as just being dressed as a way of being dressed appropriately. They don't police that very strictly. My personal rule was we either it's either one or the other. At, at a minimum it was one or the other. So if I was wearing a dress, I'd wear a dress like this that covers my shoulders, but this particular dress doesn't cover my knees. So I'm like, okay, it's one over the other is fine. If, if, as long as I'm not wearing like a strappy tank top and short shorts, which I would never wear anyway, then it's, you know, generally okay. Over here in Bahrain, and also I felt in Abu Dhabi, it's a much more conservative, they're much more conservative places. Um, you don't see as many people dressed um, dressed that way. Uh, there, are, there was a much larger sort of religious community, I guess. You see more people, especially in Bahrain anyway, there's a lot more, there are a lot more people from Saudi Arabia here, from other Arab countries, and um, generally speaking, people dress, tend to dress more conservatively. Uh, so for example, the dress I'm wearing now, I, I could wear it out and about. I, I personally wouldn't feel comfortable wearing it out because it's, slightly shorter than what I would be comfortable wearing here. I'd wear this fine in Dubai, I wouldn't have any issues with it, but it's, um, it's, I guess on me, because I'm tall, it looks almost, it's not a mini dress, it's not a mini dress at all, but it's sort of like mid-thigh, and for me, because I'm quite tall, that looks quite short, um, and so I would probably get stared at quite a lot. No one would say anything to me, but I'd be stared at, and that makes me uncomfortable, so I wouldn't wear it out. But um, I generally, if I'm going out and I'm wearing a dress, I usually wear a knee-length dress. I usually try and make sure that my shoulders are covered. 
or if they're not actually that doesn't bother me as much over here but um most of my dresses and stuff at least have cap sleeves if not full like short sleeves so they're either like stop here or here and you know that sort of area um i don't really wear shorts anyway so that's not an issue so i'm either wearing trousers or leggings and or dresses I have, quite, I have a couple of maxi dresses that I wear a lot as well. The dress code really isn't any different than what I would wear back home, to be honest, for me, because I don't tend to dress very... Uh, I don't tend to dress any differently than I did back home. Like I said, there are some of the dresses... That I, there's just a few dresses that I probably wouldn't wear out here that I would have back home or in Dubai because I personally don't feel comfortable, not because anyone else tells me I can't wear them. Um, yeah, just by the very nature of what everyone else is wearing around me. It's, um, I don't like people staring so much and I, I, some people don't mind that. I try and ignore it as best I can, but I get stares a lot um, because it's, but it's just the nature of uh, some of the nationalities here. And it's not just me. A lot of people get stares, it's not just me, but I try and avoid it. So I try to dress appropriately to avoid it, if that makes any sense. Um, so yeah, there's no, like I said, there's no real restrictions, only real restrictions are if you're going to a mosque or um, uh, like government buildings and stuff like that. I've been turned away because like I had to go get some like official paperwork done once and I got turned away because I was wearing a dress that didn't quite cover my knees exactly and they were like, no, you can't come in. I had to go home and get changed and put trousers on and go back. Um, I remember once I had to go pick up, just to pick up and collect an ID card and um, I had to do a one hour round trip when I was in Dubai to go home, get changed, go back because they wouldn't let me through the door because of the dress I was wearing. <sighs> anyway, it's happened a few times now that I've just learned my lesson. If I'm going to do anything official, anything government or any kind of official thing, I always just try and wear trousers just to avoid that happening again. But, um, but yeah, otherwise there's no nothing else really. It's not a big thing. It's not something that plays on my mind every day. I don't worry when I look in my wardrobe and I'm going to pick something out. I don't worry about whether or not I can wear that out. Nine times out of the ten, nine times out of ten, whatever I pick out, I'm going to be fine. Um, so I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Please let me know if it doesn't. Um, questions for you guys this week. I have a couple of questions for you. One, do you like this new setup? Does this work better for you? Do you prefer this background? <laughs> or would you prefer me to go back to the other side of the table? Um, either works fine for me, I'm just trying to play around, see what works. I kind of feel like maybe the lighting's a little bit better on this side, but I don't know if this is washing me out too much on this side or not. Let me know your opinions, I'm more than happy to accommodate. Um, also, I was wondering, would you like me to sh post shorter vlog style videos? Or um, when I do out and about bits in Bahrain, do you want me to post those bits as separate videos as well as part of the podcast? or? just include them in the podcast or just include them separately and not in the podcast. Um, let me know your thoughts on that. I'd be interested to know if you'd like that to be. Because well, the way I see it is I include it in the podcast and that's all great. But then like a few months down the line, if someone comes and asks me a question about something that I have a video clip for, but then I can't necessarily remember which podcast I put it in. If it's an up as a separate video, then I can always just say, oh, I have a video for that on the channel. You can go find it quite easily. It's called this or I can link it or whatever. Um, so I'm curious if, if that's something that you guys would be interested in having those little two, three minute clip videos as separate things, or would you like them as um, just being part of the podcast or both? Hope that makes sense. Um, and another question, for example, is the video that I put in earlier for the where I showed you how I blocked the Bunny Bluebell shawl, do you want me to put that in as a separate video or as well? Do you want me to, should I upload that as separately as well or should I just leave it as part of the podcast and leave it at that? Um, I'm not too sure about whether I should or shouldn't or whether you guys would be interested in that as a separate video. Um, so let me know. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that one as well. And uh, oh, and one other thing I wanted to mention, I had a few people ask this after, la after last week's episode was, the shawl that Melissa made me, I completely forgot to mention what it was. It is um, Yowza Way at Shawl number three by Susan B. Anderson that she knit out of Miss Babs Yowza in the Funny Papers colorway. And that's the one hanging behind me there that I've been pointing at. 
Um, as for shop news, there's nothing new to report this week. It is much like I said last week, I'm still working on cutting out fabrics. Um, I have some already cut out, you can see the piling up on the bed at the moment, but nothing new to report at present. I'm going to take another quick break and I'll be back to talk about Middle East life and we can review. So if you're not interested in that sort of stuff, then that is pretty much it for this week. Otherwise, um, stick around and I will be back in a little bit. And yeah. So, back now with um, some chat about Middle East life and life in Bahrain. Um, there are certain things that I have come to realise, or we have come to realise since moving to the region, and one thing is um, Western privilege. It's not nice, but it exists. Um, there are definitely things that have worked to our advantage or that have been easier for us because we are Western or from a Western country compared to other nationalities. Um, and it's not necessarily nice to think about, but it does happen. And whilst there are laws in the UK and the US and other places that guard against discrimination based on nationality or age or gender and stuff like that, things like that don't necessarily exist here in the same way or at all. Um, I remember when we were back in Dubai, I was looking to change jobs and I was speaking to this one um, recruiter. And... Um, he was a really lovely guy. He was from the UK as well, so sort of knew where I was coming from. And um, and he was being very nice about it. Like, And it wasn't something that, it wasn't even new information to me. It was something I'd thought of myself as well. But um, I didn't actually change my surname for a very long time after we got married. Um, my surname, my maiden name, is uh, Yamini. And um, yeah, so it's a very sort of Middle Eastern sounding name because I'm from Iran and it's an Iranian name, um, but but I hadn't changed my name, not because I didn't want to, but just because I was a bit lazy about it. And I was like, oh, I'll change my name when I eventually come to changing, getting a new passport. Oh, I'll just change it then. It's just easy at that point. Um, anyway, so point being, <laughs> um, I was talking to him and he was saying, have you thought about changing your name, taking your husband's name? Because he'd been speaking to Perry about something beforehand. And... Uh, <laughs> Go in the background. Um, and I was like, yeah, I had thought about it. I just hadn't done it because I was lazy. He was like, yeah, because having a Western sounding name can definitely help in sort of like the job market situation. And I was like, okay, <laughs> it's not nice to think about, but it's true. It does happen. And that's not why I changed my name in the end. I did actually have to change my passport. And so I changed it at that point, like I'd always been planning on doing anyway. But um, and at that point, I'd already gotten a new job, so it didn't really matter. Um, but yeah, that was something that was interesting. It was something I had thought of, but I didn't really think that that was such a big deal until someone else mentioned it to me. Um, and then also with regards to schools, like obviously we don't have any children, so we've not experienced any of this firsthand ourselves. But from what I've heard from other people, especially since moving here, when we first moved here, we, we were looking at this area, Saar, where we live, specifically for Perry because of how close it is to the Saudi causeway and for him to be able to come and go to work as easily as possible. Um, but as it turns out, <laughs> the number one British curriculum school in Bahrain is in this area. Um, so all of the places we were looking at were like, oh, it's only 10 minutes from St. Christopher's. It's only like five minutes from St. Christopher's, like really close to St. Christopher's. And, and I would say to Perry, what is up with this St. Christopher's? Like how amazing is the school that everyone, all the um, listings for homes and stuff are talking about how close it is to St. Christopher's. Turns out it is one of like the top 10 international schools in the world, like British curriculum schools, apparently. Um, oh, sorry, the lighting's gone really blown out there for a bit. Um, better. Um, and so, yeah, the, the waiting list to get in is ridiculous. And one of our neighbours, they are originally from Pakistan, but they lived in the UK and they have Dutch passports. Don't ask me why, I don't know. I didn't ask too many questions, it's just the way it is. And they can't even get, the school won't even give them an application form to fill in um, for their kids to go to that, to go to St. Christopher's because they're like, they don't have British passports. That was literally the reason why they wouldn't even accept an application. Um, it is a British school, British curriculum. And I guess when the school, I looked into it a little bit. When the school was initially set up, it was set up can't remember how many decades ago now but back when um 
you know, people, families were coming over and they needed a school for their children. And so they set up St. Christopher's specifically as a school for children of British expats. That was what it was meant for. And so it kind of still is. And they prioritise children with who have British passports and British parents um, over others, over other nationalities. And they don't hide it. They don't, you know, there's no, um, everyone knows about it. Everyone, loads of other parents and uh, people from other nationalities complain about it. But the school's never hidden the fact that it is there specifically for British children, uh, uh, children of British families, British parents. And um, and then there was this one instance with one of Perry's colleagues, whose birthday party we actually went to a few couple of weeks ago. She, um, her and her husband are Portuguese, but their son was actually born in the UK, so he has a British passport. But they refused him entry into the school because his parents didn't have British passports. It's crazy, but that's the thing is the school is that popular. They get that many applications that that is the level that they have to go to to sort of narrow down the people that they can let into the school because they don't have enough spaces. Now my mum works for school administration and um, for Westminster City Council in London and she's telling me some of the things and in the UK anyway at least for the, the, the public schools all the schools over here in Bahrain and Dubai and the Middle East in general majority of them are private schools um, so their entry rules and whatever are whatever they want them to be. But in the UK, the, the state schools, the, the, the public schools are, um, you know, they have catchment areas, which are like specific areas within which if you live in that area, you get priority for that school. And even then, my mum was saying that they have um, issues where they have too many people applying for certain schools because they are popular or known to be really good schools. And um, they literally have to narrow it down to the distance and then they don't just do the distance like horizontally like on a map but vertically as well so if you have two children living in the same apartment building applying to the same school the one who lives on the lower floor potentially could get in while the one who is a few floors higher up in the building won't because they are slightly further away overall distance wise which is crazy to think about but so whilst they're not discriminating based on someone's nationality, there's a different sort of, I guess, discrimination. Um, so all that to say, <laughs> it is a bit weird that, you know, just because of where you were born or what passport you hold could determine what school you can go to. And that's just what I know about one school. I don't know what the other schools are like. Like I said, I don't have any children and this is just what I've heard from other parents um, and what little information I've read online about it so far. But it's just something that was very interesting to to um, to hear about when I first heard about it, and it's it's a bit sad that it's the case, but it is in some cases. But at least the way I think about it is at least you know the school's not being um, sneaky about it. They're not you know they're, they're, it's pretty common knowledge um, that that's the case. Anyway, food for thought. <laughs> Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about is everything that happens in the Middle East when it comes to, you know, wanting to get a phone, wanting to get whatever sort of like official type things you want to get set up can always be a bit of a nightmare. It usually takes a lot of paperwork, you have to do it in person, and it's just, it could be a real faff and it could take a long time. The only thing that they seem to be really efficient at doing is cancelling stuff. It was, it's happened to us a few times now. When it's come to cancelling something, they have been super efficient. Um, it came to cancelling our credit card, and um, Perry had asked them to cancel it, and it was supposed to run until the end of this month, end of April, and it, it, they cancelled like within two days of Perry like applying to cancel it. Um, that was that took me by surprise because I wasn't expecting it, and then I couldn't use the card, and I was like, oh, okay. Um, it wasn't a big deal, but it was just unexpected. And the one time that this is super efficient, when we were leaving Dubai, Perry had to go down in person to the company, companies called Do, they are a one of the telecom companies in Dubai, one of two, uh, to cancel our home internet and phone. And I'm at home, all our furniture's gone at this point, we are two days, two or three days away from actually leaving, for the, like permanently leaving. And Perry went down to cancel Do. And uh, he went, and I was at home and I was watching stuff, I was on the computer online, and um, suddenly my internet's gone. I call Perry, I'm like, did you, did you cancel it? And he was like, I haven't even walked out of the building. 
he hadn't even left the building where the phone company was like after having cancelled it and they'd already cut us off like seriously efficient when you come to the i find you don't want it anymore you're off like cut you off straight away and it was the same with our electricity as well um not quite the same but perry had gone in and said look we want you to cancel it on this day <coughs> and they cancelled it like first thing in the morning that day i woke up there was like no ac no running water <laughs> we had nothing i was just like great but thankfully that was the last day that we were there so it wasn't um it wasn't the end of the world it was okay but it was just funny. It was just one of those things that they are super efficient when it comes to canceling something. But if you want to get something set up and get something going, it can take a while. When we wanted to actually get our due on our home internet set up in Dubai, it took like two weeks. It took them less than like five minutes to cancel it though. Um, anyway, just uh, little uh, tidbits of life, I guess, in the Middle East. You guys wanted to hear about it, so here you go. <laughs> I hope it's not too boring. Um, I had something else I wanted to talk about, but I'll probably save it for another week, about when we went to, uh, we did a trip, Perry and I did with us, a couple of friends, to uh, Misanda, which is a part of Oman, and um, I have my blocking wires hanging from the side of this cabinet with my, all the yarn in it, and that's what Hugo is attracted to. Every now and again, I hear like this little noise of the blocking wires hitting the wall, and that's him playing with it, so you can watch that happen behind me as I talk. Um, yeah, in the Sandham, and that was a really fun trip, and there was some really interesting things happened on that trip as well, so I thought maybe I'll talk about that next week, or one week when I don't have anything else to think about to talk about in this section. <sighs> Sorry if that noise is annoying. Um, but yeah, other than that, I have a little segment that I filmed a couple of days ago when I popped out to a different beach than I filmed it, than, I, than the first clip was um, in this episode. And uh, it's one that I'd sort of known was there, but hadn't actually been to. I sort of explained a little bit in the video, but basically the beaches here aren't that nice. They're not really the kind of beaches you want to go sunbathing on or go swimming in the water here. It's, you know, to put it, people litter. There's, there's not that much sort of care in that sort of thing. But also the beaches here are what I would call natural beaches. They're not manufactured. They are what they are. Whereas in Dubai, a lot of the beaches, or actually all the beaches, are manufactured beaches. Sand is mostly imported. It's not from. It's not natural. It doesn't naturally occur there like that. And um, so, so yeah, it's not. It's not really geared up for sunbathers, if that makes sense. Um, but then again, Bahrain doesn't have the tourism that Dubai does. So anyway, I've got a little clip in here for you, and I hope you'll enjoy it. I've just come down to the beach near where I live. Well, I say beach, waterfront area. Um, it's not exactly the nicest water to go swimming in. But over there off in the distance, you can see that's part of the bridge. That is the causeway between uh, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. So my husband goes over that causeway all the way off into the distance. There's a couple of little islands between in the water, but you can't actually see it. But Saudi Arabia is way off in the distance that way. And the causeway bridge is about 25 kilometers long and it crosses the water between Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. So yeah, there's this little waterfront area on the coast. This is on the uh, westernmost side of Bahrain. And you see some buildings and stuff off in the distance. There is a... so what you can see over here is the end of a fishing pier. Uh, it's not really a pier, it's a, a man-made sort of outcrop and uh, people store their boats there and fishing boats and stuff go from there. And then over here, that building that looks like a castle, oops, sorry, that one there, is um, actually someone's house. I'm not sure whose, uh, we have, I've looked on Google Maps to see if it's plotted on there, but it's uh, just shown as a private residence. There's a little, again another sort of, I don't know what you would call it, it's not really a pier but a little outcrop. Oh, there's the lunchtime prayer, call to prayer. You see there are some families, mostly women here with their children to enjoy the sunshine. It's pretty hot today, there's a construction site there. That actually is an area 
where we looked at a house when we first moved here and uh, the reason why we didn't take it was one the house was really sort of quite dark and uh, felt quite cramped but also because those buildings overlooked the back garden and uh, we weren't really fond of that idea but yeah so this is just a little little bit about where what the coastal area around where we live looks like let me just see if I can show you some of the water a bit better um, yeah I mean the water's relatively clear it's a shame that there's quite a lot of litter in the water and on the beaches. I mean, the beaches aren't so bad at the moment. I think they've been cleaned up recently. You see a bunch of bin bags waiting to be collected on there. But um, yeah, people definitely don't take care of the beaches here as much as they do in Dubai, or at least the, the government in Dubai looks after it a lot better. They have people dedicated to clean it up and stuff. But anyway, so this is a bit of it. and. Uh, there's a call to prayers going off in the background from the mosques nearby. There's, there's one mosque. Can get my, see if you can see my hand. There's one there. And there's one there that you can hear both of those at the moment on the camera. And yeah, so I think I am about to head back home now because it is blooming hot. I am baking. It is in the 90s Fahrenheit mid 30s at the moment centigrade and yeah I am about done so I hope you enjoyed this little segment and uh, I hope to take you out with me a bit more often all right take care finally back for weekend review and then I think we'll be done I'll try and keep this quick um, really quickly so last week last week last weekend Perry and I went out for dinner one night we went to this Japanese restaurant that we found online called Bushido and it was literally, it's right in the heart of the shopping sort of district, lots of apartments around and stuff in Bahrain. But where we went, it felt like it was in the middle of nowhere. It didn't feel like there was anything else around us. It was like this little oasis, like Japanese oasis in the middle of the desert island that we live on. And um, it was really good. It was very secluded. It was yummy food. I posted about it on Instagram. And um, yeah, we had a good time. And then the next morning, Saturday morning, we popped out to uh, one of the malls. Uh, Perry needed to get a haircut <laughs> and we just went out for breakfast and then had a bit of a coffee slash work morning um, at one of the coffee shops. Uh, Perry had some work to do and I had some work work to do and when I say work work I mean actual my job work um, not knitting and stuff like that work uh, which isn't work really. Um, yeah the weekend was busy catching up on work stuff like I said and trying to find out where my sewing mojo has gone because I have lost all desire to do sewing and sewing related stuff at the moment which is a bit of a shame. I am slowly plodding away on cutting fabrics and getting fabrics ready for bags and hopefully it'll come back to me at some point soon. Um, Perry will be off to Chicago next week so I'll be on my own for a few days. Um, he's got this competition thing that I mentioned a while back. Um, so yeah and then we are thinking of possibly going to Dubai for a weekend in May, possibly the first weekend, first full weekend in May, I'm not sure yet. We haven't booked the tickets, um, so we will be sorting that out soon. I'm just, you guys jumped onto the country, so I'll just turn this around, you can see. Um, yeah, so not entirely sure what we're doing with that. And then, um, oh, may have some good news on the visa front with the US sort of situation. As it turns out, I can get a uh, companion visa to Perry's student visa. If you remember last year, around June last year, I, when I filmed an episode from Dubai, I think it was episode 12-ish, maybe, and um, I was staying with a friend and I was looking after her baby at the same time. So there's a little baby in that, in that video. Um, but I was talking about how I thought I was going to have to get a full, like, visa visa for the US and um, it didn't have to do that in the end because the ESTA was fine and now I'm not allowed to go on ESTA anymore I can now get that visa visa if that makes any sense so the paperwork is coming through from Columbia University for me to be able to apply to the US Embassy here and potentially go for an interview and hopefully get a visa if I get that potentially fingers crossed if all goes well it means I'll have a visa until the end of next year um, yeah because it it extends for 12 months after Perry's studies finish 
as well, I think, because we so extensive for 12 months after his studies finished and look at that face. Okay. So fingers crossed if all goes well, at least that is somewhat of a short-term solution to my problem. And um, we'll see how it goes from there, I guess. Um, so yeah. Then the only other thing to say is I have a very short little video clip to stick in at the end here for you as a little goodbye. We were coming home the other day and Tyson was out. Tyson is our neighbor's dog. He's a German Shepherd. And by neighbor, I mean neighbor outside of our compound, um, like across the road from us. And whenever their gates are open and our gate is open, our garage door is open, he loves to come and say hi. And he'll come and meet us halfway down the road and run back to the house with us. And he loves to come hang out in our garage. So leave that at the end here for you. Thank you so much, you guys, for joining me this week. I hope you all have a lovely week ahead. And uh, yeah, and I think this is goodbye from Hugo as well. He's off. So that's goodbye from me. And thanks for joining me this week. And talk to you soon. Bye.